After high school many years ago, I was in a bad place. My guardian had kicked me out after graduation. She didn't help me find a place to stay, so I lived in my car for a couple months. I met some heavy metal dudes at work one day. I had seen them around town, and all my other friends knew who they were. Everyone loved them. We became friends over a couple months, and they offered for me to move in with them. I agreed. Looking back now, I wish I had just stayed in my car. My two main roommates were brothers, named Andrew and Seth. They were in a band. They also believed in the occult and anything of that sort. I never really believed in that stuff, but I'm not one to tell someone what they should believe. They had let me live with them rent-free for several months, so who was I to complain? Being the only female in a house full of young men, I was always looking over my shoulder. You never know who you can trust. Turns out I was right to worry. Over time, their friends started to stay with us for longer periods of time, sometimes weeks. Their friends were another group of brothers that they had gone to school with. There were five brothers in total, but only two stayed with us consistently. The younger brother, Mark, was very polite. He cleaned up after himself and always helped with the household chores. The other brother, Adam, had a laundry list of mental problems. He had apparently done some bad drugs back in the day, and it had developed into what seemed like psychosis of the religious sort. He had done time in prison for assaulting a woman with a Bible. He would often look you in the eyes and tell you he could see how you would die. Once, he told me that I was possessed by a demon and I needed my soul cleansed. Everyone in the house knew he had these problems, but he was their friend. They helped him through the hard times and gave him a place to stay. Otherwise, he would be on the streets. I was always on guard around him after the things he told me. No one else seemed to be as concerned as I was. They should have been. One day, I was sleeping and my phone rang. It was my boss. He asked if I could come into work an hour early. It was only 12 p.m., I was broke and had nothing better to do, so I said yes. I got up and began getting ready to leave. I walked out into the living room to see Mark and Andrew sitting on the couch, while Adam sat on the floor by the TV. He was watching scripture videos on YouTube. Some real end of the day crap. That was fairly common, so I went about my business. I said goodbye and left for work. My shift at work was almost complete when the phone rang. My boss answered, handed the phone to me, and said, For you. I was just a cashier, so I assumed it was a friend that couldn't reach me on my phone. I answered the phone and heard a man's voice that I didn't recognize. Hi, this is Detective Williams. Something happened at your apartment today and we need you to come to the station to talk about it. I left work immediately. I had assumed one of the brothers had been arrested for drug dealing or something. I was very wrong. I got to the station and was buzzed in. An officer escorted me to a small, cold room with a camera. He gave me a bottle of water and left me by myself for about 30 minutes. My mind was racing thinking about what could have happened. He came back in and informed me that Adam had stabbed and ended Andrew at around 1 p.m. I was shocked. I had just left the house an hour before it happened and everything seemed fine. I asked if there had been a fight. The detective informed me that there hadn't been a fight and it seemed to have happened out of nowhere. I gave my statement to the police and left with nowhere to go, still in shock and confused out of my mind. Our apartment was a crime scene, so I went to another friend's house to watch the news report since the police wouldn't give me any information on the case. Over the next couple of days, the information began to be released. Adam hadn't just stabbed Andrew once, not twice, but he had stabbed him over and over and nearly decapitated him. After the murder, he ran down the road, still holding the murder weapon. He called 911 and informed them what he had done. I watched the news report in horror. We had known he was unstable, but this? He had fully confessed to the brutal murder and provided police with his notebooks. He had apparently been planning to murder all of his brothers, my roommates, and me. He thought we were possessed by demons, and this was the only way to free us. 
Luckily, none of his other intended victims were there that day. Mark unfortunately witnessed the murder, but he luckily escaped. If I hadn't gotten that call from my boss, I wouldn't be alive today. So, to the man who brutally murdered my friend and wanted to murder me, let's never meet again. It's 3 a.m., I can't sleep, I have graduation practice today so I might as well tell this story since I have to see him later anyway. I haven't actually posted on this sub yet, but I need to rant about this. For those of you who are confused on why the title is like that, I have a small Reddit series about all the Nick Beards and Weebs I find at cons, and the reason I'm actually posting on this sub is because the dude I'm dealing with is neither a Weeb nor a Nick Beard. I'm not even sure if this belongs in this subreddit, so let me know if you think there's a better place for this. This entire mess started 13 years ago, when I moved to my neighborhood around the age of 5. I was shy and awkward, but as all 5-year-olds do, I wanted to make some semblance of friends so I tried to talk to my neighbor, Fish, who at the time was also around the age of 5. I didn't realize this was a mistake. Granted, things were normal at first. Fish was kind, albeit somewhat creepy, but at that young of an age you're easily forgiven for that. And adults don't really see you as creepy either. Fish and I took the same school bus, hung out at lunch, etc. Now as most young friendships do, Fish and I started to have distance between us. I didn't make an active effort to talk to him anymore because I had new friends. Plus, at the time, he was getting really strange. I guess that's the best word for it. He started doing reports on only fish sex for some reason, hence the nickname Fish, and didn't speak to anyone anymore, just kind of stared at me. Whenever I had a friend over, he would stare at us from his window, come up to my friend the next day, and say he saw us in the yard. If I was in the yard, he'd brag about seeing me to another friend. If my brother was in the yard, he'd ask him to grab me. I mostly just ignored this, because I was annoyed by it since this pattern of behavior started at the age of nine and my parents wrote it off as him having a crush on me, and I just didn't care. Everyone at school eventually came to know him as creepy. He would always try to touch girls, especially me, in inappropriate ways. He would always stare and of course tell our friends where we were later like it was an accomplishment. This was the beginning of his obsession with me, but at the end of the day I think he developed this because I used to be nice to him plus I'm across the street from him. Now, this is personal but important I have attendance issues when it comes to school, like most kids I was bullied and there was some other person stuff I'm not delving into right now, and eventually I did end up being pulled out of school at around the age of 13 to work on my own issues. Fish did not take well to that. He sat with my best friend every day and asked her where I was, why I wasn't going outside as often, why I wasn't at school, etc. And bless her soul for not spilling all my secrets to him, but instead moving away from him. I was far too deep in my own issues to worry about him, and honestly, I forgot he existed for a while. He started getting more precise in his reports of seeing me, though. He would still go to my friends, and this time, he gave exact time and dates. He would ask where I was, that he hadn't seen me in X amount of days, that he missed me. Red flags everywhere, I know, but we were still children, still like 13 to 14 at the time, and there wasn't anything we could do about it. When we turned 15, he decided to become more proactive. He stopped talking to my best friend and instead focused his energy on watching me and my brother, who had just started attending high school. Now, I've never seen this journal but allegedly he has been documenting everything he can see me do. And since he watched my yard, he saw me with my first boyfriend. He got pissed, stormed over. Accused me of cheating. I hadn't even spoken to him in years. I had no idea how to react. He said he loved me, so I said I was going to call the police if he didn't get off my family's property. He said he'd never give up, and he left. Everything about that just screamed wrong, and that was when I truly started becoming scared instead of annoyed. During my 15th year on Earth, I discovered my sexuality, with, actually, the help of my boyfriend who predicted it. We're still good friends, and I tried to be more open again, like I was when I was five. I was going to a therapeutic day school instead of my public high school. 
I was still struggling, but I worked hard to be a better person. I also changed my name, although it wasn't much of a change as it was just making it official, since everyone called me that nickname anyway. I guess he heard about the fact that I had come out as lesbian and took it as a personal insult. He started changing everything about himself, he had pretty much attempted to become my perfect boyfriend, and now he turned into anti-me. These are just some examples, so don't get butthurt please, obviously I respect all opinions and I'm not attacking yours, just stating my experience. I was for repealing the second amendment, he was against it. I was, obviously, for gay marriage, he was against that too. I'm agnostic, I'm not religious at all. At the age of 16 he found our Lord and Savior Jesus trademark and became the school equivalent to a cultish preacher. And of course, I really like anime. And he really hates anime. Now for the last opinion, I'm not saying that lightly. I like anime a lot, actually, as the title suggests I work as a professional, part-time, cosplay model, I travel around the country and make my living working with photographers and cons alike. Of course it all doesn't involve anime, but anime is the main nerdy thing I am into, besides video games, and I really enjoy what I do. I started working as a model when I was 16, and he started hating anime with a passion around that time too. He finally started to become violent around that time. Anything involving Japan in some way, he would attack. He actually stopped talking to the Asian students at our school because they were too similar to Japanese students, which is a real big racist yikes. He would go on and on about how anime is the creation of a devil that everyone should be ashamed. He beat up a kid for wearing a My Neighbor Totoro jacket. He never said any of this to me directly. He more or less just spoke to someone else near me because he was too scared to talk to me. I still didn't even attend his school and this man hates me with a passion. I, and the rest of the world, tried our best to ignore him. I'm 17 now. Prom came up a month or two ago. Despite going to a therapy school, my school allows me to attend all their events as if I was a student. He decided it would be a good idea to try and talk to me. He calls me by my old name, which is really disrespectful because he's been corrected on it a lot, and I don't know what to do beyond saying hi. I think the reason he calls me by my old name is because he has this preconceived idea of me in his head, and this new me is terrible or something. I was in a crowded area. But have you ever been looked at so intensely it's like the room fades away? There was just something broken in his eyes as he looked at me, something that really scared me. He asked me, once again, why I hadn't been outside lately. I laughed awkwardly, and I said, does it matter? He sounded flat as he said, I haven't seen you in your front or backyard, or your basement. Where have you been? His house faces my front yard. The only way he could see into my basement, which has glass windows in the very back, and my backyard is if he actually went outside and waited for me in the bushes slash trees of my yard. I didn't have a chance to respond back because my best friend has spidey senses and her gut told me that I wasn't feeling so good and she zoomed over, whisking me away. He was still staring at me the entire time we were leaving. I went into the bathroom after that and cried. It wasn't like anyone could help me either, I don't have proof he's in my yard. But after that, I started receiving hang-up calls. I'm still getting those. His car has often blocked me off in traffic. I feel like my own fears aren't even justified because he hasn't technically done anything, but at the same time, I'm freaked. So, Fish, even though we're about to meet once again at this graduation thing, I hope I never speak to you again. First things first, I got to rip the band-aid off and admit that from late 2001 to mid-2003, when I was a teenager, I wrote fanfiction and posted it online. My stories weren't that great, but I made friends because I posted them, so I don't regret doing it. Even after I stopped posting stories, I was still active online and instead posted fan art and dumb stuff about the role plays I did with my buddies over on DeviantArt. Cringe, cringe, maybe I sound like a lame fangirl, but whatever, I was having fun. Fast forward to 2008, 
when I got a PM on do that was, well, I really wasn't expecting online life to take such a strange turn on that particular random day, but. The writer, Ari, began her missive by informing me, a complete stranger, that she was seriously mentally ill. She listed a wide variety of disorders including schizophrenia which had tormented her all her life. She then said she was scared to write to me like this, but that she had to do it so she could move on. Move on from what, you ask? From her hatred of me, of course. Ari wrote that she had hated me for a long time based on the fanfiction I wrote because my stories terrified her. Okay. Now let's be clear here. I wrote stories about characters from cartoons and one comic book. One of the characters from that comic was a violent and terrible person and I wrote about him doing violent things, but that's not what was scaring her. No. Ari was scared because she was in love with said violent character, John, and believed they were destined for each other and that he talked to her in her head. And then she read my fanfiction and suddenly John stopped talking to her. And she knew it was because he was talking to me instead. She was absolutely certain that I had stolen her true love from her. She said that after that, she developed a belief that I was the arbiter of her reality more generally. That is a direct quote. I will never forget that phrase and that I was capable of reaching into her mind and not only reading, but taking away her precious thoughts. This caused her so much anguish and suffering. However, she went on, deep down she also knew this was a delusion caused by her mental illness. Ari closed her PM by begging me to respond to her, to confirm that I was just a normal girl so she could get past this trauma I had caused her and be happy again. Now, I have to again rip off a band-aid of inviting judgment here by admitting that sometimes I am a complete dumbass. I am also a soft-hearted person, and the idea that someone could have been harmed by the silly stories I'd posted years earlier made me kinda sad. So I did a soft-hearted but ultimately dumbass thing and responded. Yes, yes, I was a normal teenage girl when I posted that stuff and now I am a normal early 20s woman with no mind-stealing superpowers, lol. Also, I don't know you and had no idea you existed until you sent me this, so how could I have singled you out to hurt you with my fanfics? Please don't worry about me. And I thought, what a kind person I am, and surely that will be the end of it. Wrong. Ari replied to me, using a different, upbeat, and cheerful tone, saying she was so glad I wrote back to her because now she knew she didn't have to fear me and we could just be friends. She loved my fanfics, honestly, and by the way what was my real name so she could find me on Facebook. Um, excuse me? No? A dumbass I may be, but I ain't that stupid. I told her I didn't have a Facebook, a lie and was busy with school, a truth, so I wouldn't be on DeviantArt a whole lot, a half-truth, but I wished her good luck with her mental health recovery and hoped she would have a good life, a truth, I mean, so far she just seemed troubled and weird, but I wouldn't have wished harm on her. I didn't get a response to that, but... A few months later I got a DeviantArt PM from another account I didn't know, that simply asked, Hey, Fox Gay Socks, how do you get your characters to talk for you? Now, I hadn't posted any fanfiction for years, but I was still participating in fandom and talked online about writing, and I honestly thought this question was about writing, specifically dialogue. I mulled over how to respond and ended up not answering right away. I went back to my PMs a few days later and saw I had another new message, this one saying, with a lot of exclamation points and crytyping style misspellings, that I had to answer and teach this stranger how to talk to my characters, and that I didn't know how long this user had suffered because of me. Oh my goodness, I wonder who it was, using another account. And guess what, I was still a goddamn dumbass. So I answered the first message, but sort of detached L.Y., ignoring the desperation of the second message and just kind of giving tips for how to learn a character's voice and how to write dialogue for them. Once again, I got a very chipper reply, including a confession that yeah, it was Ari, and she just loved talking to me and thought I was so nice and such a good friend to be patient with her and answer her burning questions about how to talk to my yes, specifically M.Y. characters. Because you see, she had realized she was not just in love with John, but with M.Y. John, from my stupid fanfiction. And now, she could talk to him anytime because we were friends. 
I got the idea that she was not asking to role play and instead thought she would be able to communicate directly with this once removed fictional character now. But I feigned ignorance and said something like, ah, uh, our RP group is kind of private and not accepting new members, but I hope I answered your question and please have a good day. Because, see, I didn't really want to be friends with someone who a, seemed to believe I was somehow responsible for her mental illness slash health despite not knowing her from Adam and having only spoken to her twice, and b, had already told me once that she hated me and thought I could control her reality. On the kinder side of things, I honestly didn't think continuing to converse would be good for either of our comforts. On the meaner side, I just really, really didn't want to interact with this person anymore and felt I had already done more than enough to help this stranger. Okay, so, she stopped responding to me and I thought this strange interlude in my life was over. Wrong. Now fast forward seven entire years to early July 2015, at which time I had moved my main online presence to Tumblr. I'd left a note on my DeviantArt account in 2011 when I moved, giving my new Tumblr screen name so my fandom buddies could find me easily. At this point, I had not posted any fanfiction for over a decade. I also was not talking much at all online about John, except to reblog the occasional post someone else made about the comic he was from, as you do on Tumblr. Suddenly, I received an anonymous request. And that question said in no uncertain terms that I was the cause of the asker's suffering. Because I had callously disregarded others' feelings. It closed with some kind of weird threat. I can't remember exactly what now because I instinctively deleted the task due to being unnerved. I guessed that it could be Ari, based on the typing style and the fact that there couldn't be two people in the world who think I make them suffer, right? But it had been seven years, so I wasn't entirely sure. And then I did yet another dumbass thing. I made a post that said something along the lines of to the Anon that just sent me a vaguely threatening ask. Sorry if anything I've posted has upset you. Please let me know if I can tag my posts a certain way so you can block whatever content you find distressing. A couple days later I got another Anon ask calling me a prattling ostentatious idiot, direct quote, and saying it doesn't work that way and strong emotions cannot just be blocked. The message went on, you stole him away from me and I have been living in turmoil since and you don't care. Ah, uh, yes, definitely Ari, there was no question about it. After all, I haven't stolen anyone else's fictional boyfriend that I know of. I turned off anonymous requests. I also went back to my old, untouched DeviantArt account where I found a comment on my front page from yet a third account there that said, if you still talk to him, tell him that I love him and that I always will. He was the first man I ever loved, and it was your version of him I loved above all. I have been jealous, angry at you, angry at myself, depressed, and psychotic. I tore myself to shreds over him and my heart aches and cries. The first cut is the deepest. I love you, John. The date on this message was June 28, 2015, just a few days before the first Anon ask on Tumblr. I did a little internet sleuthing, just a simple Google of Ari's known usernames, and found her Fur Affinity account, where she had posted screeds in her journal about hating anyone else who wrote or drew anything about John. Oh gay. I also discovered through this Google search that I was not completely special in triggering Ari's ire, and that she had also gone after another person on Tumblr in much the same way, demanding answers to emotionally charged asks, assuming friendship where there wasn't any, and then stalking the person using multiple accounts and email addresses and accusing them of harming her. This other person had amassed a collection of screenshots of Ari's behavior, and it was really super not good. Anyway. I figured since I'd blocked Anon, maybe she'd just go away. Wrong. Ari's next wave of stuff began in 2016, when someone started reblogging my personal text posts with cryptic comments like, You have a beautiful soul. The username was nothing like Ari or any of the other account names she'd used before, so I just thought someone was being socially awkward. But after a few months of this, I received a message from this account through Tumblr's chat function that let the cat out of the bag. This person said something like, I'm a British female creature with, insert same litany of mental illnesses from Ari's first PM in 2008, and I'm so scared of dying alone and friendless. 
I used to read your fanfiction and it always made me feel better. I think you're an amazing woman and would like to get to know you better. Please, I'm begging you, don't leave me alone in the dark. Well this sure sounded a lot like Ari to me. This was confirmed when I went to the person's Tumblr and saw they had recently posted something passive-aggressive about that other Tumblr user Ari was known to stalk. And if that wasn't enough, they also had a lot of weird innuendo-laden posts about John and a couple other characters, including Sherlock and a man I didn't recognize and who they claimed to have legally married. It was at that point that I finally decided to stop being a soft-hearted dumbass. I blocked the account that sent me the chat message right away, without responding. Over the next several months, Ari attempted to contact others on Tumblr who it was obvious I talked to a lot. My girlfriend, our best friend, etc. She sent them chat messages like the one paraphrased above, hilarious in the case of my girlfriend, who never wrote any fanfiction, begging for their friendship and also, you know, just casually asking what I was doing, whether they could get me to talk to her, that sort of thing. I know my GF and BFF blocked her too after they asked me who the hell this person was and I told them the whole story. I also discovered that on Tumblr you can choose an option to allow chat messages only from people you follow. With that account blocked and no one I don't follow able to send me chat messages, I naively thought again that surely this weird nonsense would end. Wrong. See the thing about Tumblr, if you're not familiar with the website, is that if you block someone they just can't interact with your posts or follow you. A block causes someone to auto-unfollow you, and they won't see your posts on their dash, feed. They also won't be able to send you questions. However, they can still go to your actual blog, username.tumblr.com, and see everything you post. If they try to interact with any of your posts on your blog, reply, reblog, like, they won't be able to. Which will, of course, tip them off that you blocked them. Beginning in 2018, Ari engaged in a whirlwind of activity. She made a new account, sent me an ask or 15 saying things varying from please talk to me, I'm harmless, you don't know how hard it is to be me, to I'm so scared of the darkness, to humans are social animals and I am dying without you, to I guess you like psychos like John, but can't handle a real psycho like me, to I want to kidnap you far away in a happy ending, my darling. So I blocked that account immediately. So she made a new account and reblogged some post I'd made a while back about John's comic book with a comment like my first love. The first cut is the deepest before sending me multiple asks all saying, you stole him from me. So I blocked that account immediately. So she made another one, made some meme generator, sparkly pictures of rats and spiders with text like I just want to sit next to you and be your friend. I'm not scary and posted them with that username so this mention would show up on my dash's activity feed so i blocked that account so she made a new account posted a quote from my favorite author well-known info i post about him frequently and sent me a couple asks saying that this author would disagree with how i was treating her by continuing to block and shun her friendship when she was harmless and just thought i was an amazing person so i blocked that account mate did you forget you called me a prattling ostentatious idiot and threatened me because I sure haven't. This went on for 10 accounts, one of which had the blog title in huge letters at the top, hello, my nickname reserved only for close friends. One of which she inundated with photos of herself glaring at the camera, my first looks at her face, and I don't like to judge people on appearance, but this girl has a really creepy glare and also looks like she has not showered in weeks at ING me in each one. She only ever used one of these accounts to actually post, reblog, and like things from other people like a seemingly normal user, albeit one who made some questionable comments sometimes. All the rest only existed to bother me. I started trying to report her to Tumblr after the third or fourth time for making multiple accounts solely to evade my blocks, but if you know anything about Tumblr, you can guess they didn't respond with more than an automated okay we'll look into this, in the meantime have you tried blocking this user? 
Anyway, throughout 2018 I just had to deal with the fact that anytime I saw the little red flag above my ask box icon, it would probably be something creepy and either threatening or passive aggressive from Ari that would put me on edge for a few hours and remind me that no matter what I do on Tumblr, she can read everything I post. I haven't gotten anything from her so far in 2019, but I figure as long as she's out there there's always the chance she'll come back. Maybe not right away, maybe not until another 10 years from now, but let me just say, Ari, you freaking weirdo, I'm genuinely sorry about your mental illnesses and hope you get help for them, but while they may explain some of your behavior, they don't excuse it. I am not and never will be your friend, because you are not harmless. You made me heavily curtail my social interaction on Tumblr by cutting off a couple methods of communication that could have been used to make new friends. You made me worried about ever talking there about a comic I enjoy. You made it so anytime I see I have an ask my heart rate goes up because it might be more of your disturbing bullcrap. You've harassed my loved ones and also other strangers who probably didn't do anything to deserve it, etc. I don't control your reality but if I did, you can bet I'd use that power to ensure we'd never meet. This happened when I was around 17 years old and is still happening now. At 17 I felt lost in the world and stuck in a job I disliked with work colleagues that didn't like me. This had to do with my accent as I was quite well spoken so they thought I was a rich kid. It all started on a Friday after work. The factory I worked in had a half day on Fridays, so I would just spend the rest of the day wandering around the city I lived in. It had been a tough day of relentless mocking and I was reaching my breaking point. I went around the city looking for a new job. I visited the police recruitment center, the army, navy, and air force centers and even the international red cross. I just wanted to get away from it all. After a few hours, I had a bag full of career pamphlets and still no idea what to do with my life. I turned a corner and immediately saw a sign sitting in front of me. I can remember it so vividly now. It said, free personality test. Are you curious about yourself? Come in. I then looked up at the building and in a big fancy sign outside it said, The Church of Scientology. Now before I continue, yes, I already knew about Scientology however, I had a morbid curiosity about it. I had heard all the horror stories and goings on inside the church. But Tom Cruise was my favorite actor and he seemed to have his life sorted out pretty good. My famous last words right there. So, I went inside. I was immediately greeted by a very nice lady. She asked me how I was doing and what she could do for me today. I asked if I could speak to somebody about the church and the personality test. She smiled and said, I would be happy to. Please take a seat and I will get you someone to speak to. After a minute, I was introduced to an older man named Alan and he was the head of my city's Scientology Center. Alan took me to a small room to talk privately. When we entered, I immediately noticed the large picture of L. Ron Hubbard on the wall. We sat down and had a nice talk. I told him about how I was unhappy about where my life was going. I told him about how I wanted to leave plus all the trouble I was having at work. He seemed genuinely concerned for me and I felt like he wanted to help. After a while of talking, I agreed to do the personality test. He gave me the test and left the room saying to give the test to the receptionist after I had finished. Two hours later I finished it. Not joking, that's really how long it took. It was around 500 questions about anything and everything. I handed it into the receptionist, and she told me it would take some time to process. In the meantime, Alan had told her to take me to their private cinema and show me a film. I thought it was just going to be some old room in the back with the TV on the wall, but no. They did indeed have a private cinema. It could seat around 50 people and had a large screen in the front. It did feel a bit weird just being by myself in a cinema owned by Scientology. But I bet that hasn't happened to many people. Or maybe it has. Anyway, I sat down, and they played me the film. It was about 30 minutes long and consisted of a narrator explaining those strange feelings you sometimes get, with some mediocre acting following along. I remember a section about how much you doubt yourself, knowing you have locked a door but going back to check multiple times. At one point the film showed how a past event that happened to your mother while she was pregnant with you, could affect your life in a negative way. Example, your mother was sick on a flight, so you are scared of flying. I also vaguely remember something about rotten eggs and how much an event involving them can hurt you. I know it sounds absurd but in some ways the film really made sense to me. When the film was done, 
I was taken to Alan's office and he told me my results. He told me I was extremely depressed, one of the most unmotivated people he had ever met, lacking cognitive thinking and I was a waste of talent. Now this made me very upset, but Alan said he could help me. He gave me about four books and a DVD. He told me to read the books and watch the film before my course. I asked, what course, and Alan told me he had signed me up to do a course at the center. He convinced me that if I didn't do this course that my life would soon spiral out of control. He made me hand over quite a lot of money for the course and said I would receive an email about the course which was in a month's time. I left the center, ran home, and immediately started reading the books I was given. This happened all over the weekend. I had basically locked myself in my room and did nothing but read and reread those books and watch the DVD over and over again. Over the next week I began taking notes about myself and my family. I emailed Alan with questions and concerns, I started resenting my mother for my life. I began to think that she was the problem, that everything bad that happened to me was the result of her. I started to treat her badly, swearing at her and did the best I could to ignore her. When I emailed Alan about my mother, he told me that if she was the catalyst for my problems then maybe I should consider disconnecting from her. And I took that bull crap seriously. I made plans to totally leave her out of my life. A week before my course I developed some kind of God complex towards everyone around me. What I read in those books told me what I could become. I saw everyone in my family as below me. I really became a truly spiteful person. Just days before my course I was confronted by my mother and father. They said they were concerned about me and they searched my room. My dad took out all of my Scientology books and the DVD. I was outraged. I screamed and cursed at my parents. I said horrible wicked things to them. I told them how I was going to leave them and how I never wanted to see them again. Hours of arguing back and forth, tears and crying. However, in the end they did convince me that the church was a bad place. They said, if I was so miserable at work, I should have told them, and that is true. To this day I can't believe I didn't say anything to them. Instead I went to Scientology. That night, after the arguing had stopped. They sat me down and comforted me. I really couldn't believe it. After the way I had treated them for the past three weeks, they still cared for me. The next day I emailed Alan and told him I would not be coming back to the church. He quickly got back to me asking why. Asking if it was my family and if I was being forced to not go. However, I ignored him. The emails I revived in the next few weeks were mad. He told me stuff like, I should leave my family now and I could stay at the church. He tried to convince me that it was all because of my mother. He even emailed me to say something along the lines of, he won't be surprised if he read in the papers that I was found dead by suicide. I'm very sure he crossed a line there, but I just kept ignoring him. The strangest email I got was one in all binary code. 00110101 this and 100010101110 that. I used a binary code translator, but it all came back as mixed up letters and numbers. None of it made sense. I eventually blocked him. However, it still hasn't stopped. About two or three times a year I will get an email from the church. It's either asking how I'm or asking about my family. When I get them, I immediately block the email address. But they just keep coming. It's always someone new, saying they heard about my case and they were worried about me. The whole reason I'm writing this is because I just got one the other day and I thought it would make a good warning. Please, I beg of you. Do not go to a church or Scientology center. If they can make me spitefully degenerate in just a few hours, then what can they do with the person in a few months or a year? If anyone has any idea how to block an entire religion slash cult from my email, then please let me know. And if you're lost in life, sad or upset, then please, please talk to your family, friends, or a doctor. When you are down, don't let others make you into a monster. Take it from me. After this event I got help and I'm a happy confident person now. I grew up in Ohio in the 70s and me and my childhood friend Joe were outside all the time we could manage it. Joe lived on a farm that bordered a pretty big forest and my parents would drop me off in the morning and we'd stay in the woods all weekend. We'd only come out for school. We loved pretending we were frontiersmen. We'd build shelters, traps, practice making fire with sticks, the whole nine yards. When we got to be in high school, we got this notion to pull a stand by me. This was based on the movie of the same name that had just come out. The idea was that we'd walk the railroad tracks out in the country. But instead of looking for a dead body, we'd find cool bridges to fish from. 
and camp a little ways off the tracks. Of course, we knew this was dangerous and we'd likely be trespassing, but we were kids. We had a lot of fun. We did find beautiful rivers, we discovered bridges no one went to, we fished, we hid from trains. At night we camped in woods just near the tracks and made small hidden fires. Nothing bad ever happened. It was idyllic. In fact, it was so fun we did it multiple times. Never had a problem. After high school me and Joe went our own ways. We both left home, but always stayed in touch and always tried to coordinate visits so we'd see each other occasionally. Well one summer in the mid-90s it worked out that we were both in town for about a week. we do stuff with family during the day, and at night we'd either catch drinks at a bar or sit outside Joe's house around a fire and talk about the old days. One night, me and Joe got to talking about our stand-by-me trips. Well, nostalgia and beer are a hell of a mix. Soon we decided to take a day, walk the rails, camp one night and walk home. The day came, we started out early in the morning. We had my wife drop us off in our old spot where we used to start, right outside our hometown. She thought this was absolutely crazy and made sure to mention it. When she pulled away, Joe suggested that instead of walking the usual route, we'd take the opposite direction, just to be adventurous. We knew the land well, we had a map, so I gave a what the hell and off we set. The day went fine, it was fun and a little sad, but in a good way. We found a bridge and sat on the edge smoked a joint and moved on. We had no fishing gear, but we brought some canned food and other stuff. Before night started to set in, we picked a spot to camp. It was a thick forested area, trees on every side of the train tracks so you felt like you were in a tunnel. We had brought small hammocks to sleep on, but before we set them up we decided to do a little scouting of the perimeter. Now, this is what we used to do in the old days too. We'd walk the area around a little bit to make sure some dude's house wasn't just over a hill and we were actually camping in their yard. We walked maybe a hundred or so feet into the woods and up a small incline. We figured if we didn't see anything from on top of this short hill, we'd be fine. But when we got to the top, we saw an old building down at the bottom, about a hundred yards into the woods. It was barely visible. We pondered over what to do. We both assumed it was a sugar shack or something, because there didn't appear to be a clear road into it. From where we were, there didn't look to be anyone in it either. All was quiet, no movement could be seen. No lights. We decided to walk a little closer just to make sure. We came down the hill very slowly and as we neared the building we saw it wasn't a sugar shack at all, it was an old church. It looked like it had been abandoned for years. It was a squat, sagging building whose wooden planks were almost black from years of moss and rot. A cross still stood on top of the place, also weathered black. None of the windows had glass and there were no doors, just open doorways. We got close enough to see inside, there were rows of pews and a built-up section in front for a preacher to stand. We didn't go all the way in, we didn't want to. Beyond all that, there was no sign of anyone else. No footprints, no paths, no roads. It was an abandoned church. We left immediately and went back up the hill to our spot we had picked to camp. Having a hill between us and the church made us feel better but we were still a little uneasy. We chalked it up to the natural creepiness seeing a church in the middle of the woods would elicit. Besides, at this point it was dusk and we just decided to rig up our hammocks and go to sleep and move on early in the morning. Night set in, and as we lay in our hammocks and shot the crap, we began to hear something in the direction of the church. Our conversation about it went a little like this. Do you hear that? What the EFF is that? It sounds like people singing. And it did sound just like singing. We both slid right out of our hammocks and hunkered down, straining to hear more. We listened for a minute or two, and the singing continued but it wasn't getting louder. Finally we decided to creep back up the hill and see if we could spy where the sound was coming from. We could still move very quietly in the woods from the old days, it was second nature to us. The moon was barely out but it provided enough light so you wouldn't walk right into a tree, but it was near pitch black. We didn't use flashlights as we crept slowly up the hill and we didn't talk. When we got to the top we saw light in the distance. It was coming from the church. And the singing was coming from inside. Joe and I put our heads close together and had a hushed conversation that boiled down to, can you believe this? The light looked to be candlelight from the way it flickered, and though we tried, we couldn't make out what was being sung. It sounded like church music, but in another language. We sat and watched for a while, trying to see who was in there, but we only saw occasional shadows. We had no intention of getting closer either. We had about a football field length between us and we aimed to keep it that way. 
The singing continued for a bit, and then it stopped. After that, a booming male voice began to chant. I was already freaked out, but this voice thoroughly scared the EFF out of me. It sounded like some Old Testament preacher you see in movies, but again it was like he was speaking in a different language because we couldn't understand a single word. Eventually it got to where the single male voice would say something and then a bunch of voices would answer in song. This lasted for a while and then they all broke into this long, sustained wail that just kept getting louder. It got so loud and so disturbing that I covered my ears. Then it stopped. At this point I was just getting ready to say, let's get the hell out of here, when Joe put a hand on my shoulder and hissed, they're coming out. We were far enough away that we couldn't make out really well, but what we could see was a line of figures walking out the open doorway, all holding hands in single file. We could see some of them had flashlights. They began to sing again, and the light from the flashlights began to move toward us and the hill. We booked it back down to our campsite, grabbed our crap and ran to the tracks. Once there, we ran down the tracks in the direction we had come from. After a few minutes, we stopped and looked back. We saw lights coming down the hill. They were moving erratically like whoever was holding them was shaking them. We continued to run in spurts and walk as fast as we could. We eventually stopped seeing the lights and came to a road. By our map we knew a small town was about 15 minutes down it, and we walked there, got to a 24-hour gas station and called my wife to come get us. My wife and other friends all just thought it was kids messing around, but I heard those voices and they sure as hell didn't sound like kids to me. Not sure who those people were, but it was definitely the creepiest thing that happened to me out in the woods. Long Time Lurker First Time Poster This happened about 12 years ago. I was 16 to 18 during the duration and was female identified at the time. I'm still not sure what to make of this situation but I've just started to realize it may have been more sinister than I thought. This story needs some caveats. First, I'm incredibly naive when it comes to someone flirting with or hitting on me. I never think people are serious when they hit on me and this has gotten me into some tight spots in the past. Some of those, like this one, I got out of, others I wasn't so fortunate. This also means that until very recently I didn't realize the danger I've been in. Second. I grew up in a very small and very evangelical Republican town. My small Methodist church wasn't too crazy on Sunday mornings but the youth group was much more radical, speaking in tongues, being slain in the spirit, etc. And when I say my town was small I mean that my graduating class was 149 students and we were the biggest graduating class in years. My school was so small that my father was my teacher for three years. Everyone knew my dad and my family. Third, I believed. For most of my youth, that the most important objective in the world was saving souls for Jesus Christ. This conviction trumped everything else, especially feelings of discomfort. In high school I joined Young Life and became a junior leader quickly after. Young Life, for those who don't know, is like a cooler version of a youth group, although they would reject this. College kids would meet with high schoolers. They were cool and loved Jesus and would preach at you without you knowing it. We would meet with any high schooler who wanted to come to someone's house on Wednesdays. It was usually at my parents' house. So I was in high school trying to get people to come to my house to hear about Jesus. Anyone and everyone was welcome, including Ted. Ted was two to three years older than me and he was just a weird guy. I don't mean that as a judgment. I'm freaking weird. It's more that there was something off about him. At the time I didn't want to listen to my gut telling me to get the EFF away. Ted was very poor as was the case for most in my school, so he usually was wearing tattered and smelly clothes. He also couldn't afford a car so he would walk everywhere, which was a feat in a rural town. Before we started having meetings at my house I would give him rides to ones at other places, I would see him walking there on the side of the road and I felt bad. The first meeting at my house he showed up three hours early. I was a little put off but I figured he didn't have a great home life and thought he just wanted out of his home. I gave him some food and let him have free reign of our computer while I did homework and such. The meeting happened and he went home. I told myself that this was proof that mild feelings about him were just my sinful and judgmental nature. After that I started to see him around school more and it weirded me out a bit but I chalked it up to paranoia. Women often feel that they are overreacting when they feel threatened by men, mostly because society and literally everyone else tells us we are. Don't ignore your gut. The next time I had young life at my house he literally showed up right from school, about an hour walk to my house, four hours early. 
I was not expecting him at all and my parents weren't home from work yet. I had been in the shower when he showed up. I came down in my bath towel and a towel wrapped on my head. When I heard knocking I assumed it was my cousin, my best friend and closest neighbor, so I didn't bother to get dressed. There he was and I'm in my goddamn towel. I told him he could help himself to what was in the fridge and he could use the computer while I finished getting ready. I ran upstairs and locked the bathroom door. I texted my parents and cousin asking when they'd be home but no one responded. I finished my shower and got dressed. When I came out of my room he was standing at the foot of the stairs just staring. I was completely unnerved and asked him if he was having problems with the computer. He didn't say anything, just stared at me and eventually went back downstairs to the basement where the computer was. I ran to my room, locked the door, and waited for one of my parents to get home. Finally the meeting took place and he went home. Then he started showing up at random places that I was. I still can't figure out how he knew. I would be at the mall, or the soccer field, or home and he would just be there. He started showing up at my parents' house on days there weren't meetings. Luckily around this time I got my license and I kept offering rides to anyone. I would caravan people home and by the time I got back Ted would be there but so would my parents. Thankfully, my dad started to catch on even though I never said a word to anyone. My dad was a woodshop teacher. He and my mom built their house and he built himself an epic woodshop detached from the house. When Ted would come over my dad would direct him to his woodshop and make him help him with the project while telling him I wasn't around until he left. This happened until I graduated where Ted would just be there. After I went to college in a different state Ted kept showing up at my parents' house until my dad told him I wouldn't be around anymore. So anyways, is this guy a stalker, lonely, socially inept? It just creeps me out. I'm back in my hometown to take care of my parents. Ted, let's not meet. This story still gives me chills and I haven't spoken of it in a while. This is a long story and needs extensive backstory, so please bear with me. So, flashback to high school. I wasn't the most social guy in school. I had my really close friends but other than that I would classify myself as a loner. I had really bad acne which affected me a lot when meeting new people and I was very addicted to World of Warcraft. So it was Friday night. Classic raid night in vanilla World of Warcraft. About two hours before the raid my best friend that I grew up with, let's call him T, called me. He's like, yo bro, I'm meeting up with two women later tonight. Let's drink and hang out with these women. It was one of those classic fork in the road moments. Be a nerd and blow another Friday night playing a video game or go out with my best friend and see if I can finally lose my virginity. Before I get to the next part of the story I need to give some backstory on T. T was nothing short of a boss and I truly looked up to him. He is a really good looking guy and is extremely intelligent. I'm not understanding this, he's the type of guy when he walks into a room all the women just gravitate to him. But T has a dark side. Even though he has everything going on for him, it was never good enough. He got expelled from the school we both went to for having a couple grams of weed, aka just trying to flex and got caught by a teacher. So he was sent to another school about 30 minutes away from me. Nothing changed, and it actually got far far worse. He became, the guy. He started effing all the hot chicks and became a massive drug dealer. He supplied about 4 or 5 high schools slash colleges in the area, and was for sure on the radar of the law and other rivals. Now back to the story. So after playing mental ping pong for about 30 minutes weighing all the options, potentially get laid, drunk, or nerded up like usual, I finally say EFF it, count me in for tonight T. I bribe my brother 20 bucks and he agrees to raid for me. And the night begins. T picks me up from my place and greets me with a big smile and says, we're getting laid tonight brother. I'm like whatever bro we'll see. I'm very used to T over exaggerating. So I quickly ask, when are we meeting up with these women? It's about 9.30 p.m. at this point. Under his voice he says around 1 a.m. I'm like what the hell are we supposed to do for three and a half hours? T pulls out a bottle of Bacardi 151 with the metal grate and passes it to me. Thankfully I had been drinking hard that year so my tolerance was decent. We head to this awesome park to burn time and start passing the bottle back and forth. We catch up on life and we're about 6 out of 10 drunk at this point, it's around 11.30. So with an hour and half still to burn before we're supposed to meet with said women, T says, let's roll to Taco Bell, we can get some food and sober up. At this point I'm drunk and we have some time to burn, so what the hell, let's head to Taco Bell. As most degenerates know, 
Taco Bell is open late, and the one we went to is located in a shopping center. No surprise around 12 a.m. there are no cars whatsoever in the parking lot except for the workers of Taco Bell. T rolls up to buy his food and we just park outside Taco Bell while he eats. While T is eating, I snag a cigarette and get some fresh air. As I puff away on a Marlboro light, a white van rolls up with tinted windows and no license plate. The van parks to the west of our car about 50 feet away in this empty parking lot. The lights inside and outside the van instantly turn off and no one gets out. I keep smoking, but I don't think much of it. I mean we were essentially doing the same thing, but a car with no license plate was obviously weird. I get back into T's car and I start getting a really uneasy feeling about this van. At this point I've sobered off a little, and I just keep eyeing down this van, something doesn't feel right. It chose to park three quarters of the way into this parking lot with a perfect view of our car. I turn to T and tell him it's time to leave. This is where the backstory comes into play. As I mentioned, T was in very deep at this point and was at the height of his drug dealing career. So that exact thought was in the back of my mind when this van was parked inconspicuously. This next part is not exaggerated in the slightest. T turns on his headlights on his car to leave. And almost instantly after our lights are on, the white vans turn their lights on. My stomach dropped to the floor. At this point we're both freaking out. T knows he could be busted by the police at any point and that's not even considering all his rivals and people he's effed over. So right when we see the light turn on from the van, we turn ours off. And no freaking joke, the van turns their lights off to mimic our reaction. T reaches to the back seat of his car and pulls out a backpack with a weapon in it. I can't believe this is actually going down. At this point I'm itching on crying. This is obviously no coincidence, we were followed to this shopping center. We sat paralyzed in fear and dripping in sweat for the next 10 minutes waiting to see if the van would move, it didn't. T starts mumbling to himself. This might be a goon squad that was hired to hunt me down. I'm speechless at that comment. I was a normal unsocial kid who loved sports and video games, and now I'm in this terrible and possibly life-threatening situation. At this point, I really wish I just stayed home and played World of Warcraft. No potential sex is worth the heart attack I'm currently going through. I felt extremely nauseous and I'm so close to throwing up. Is this actually happening or am I dreaming? This doesn't feel like the police, they wouldn't go through this type of charade. They would have turned on their lights and arrested us by now. I can't stand this demented showdown we're currently in. I'm on the verge of a mental breakdown and tears are rolling down my face. I turn to T and tell him to turn on his lights one more time. Almost like clockwork, the van flicks on their lights. But this time was very different, I was able to see multiple shadows of hooded men in the van. I turn to T and tell him to effing book it out of here. I've never seen someone go 0 to 60 out of a shopping center before, but you can bet your ass we did. T turns his head while exiting the shopping center and sees the van following us at a fast pace. We start cutting down side roads for the next 5 minutes. Thankfully no one is following us anymore. At this point, I'm just staring at T and ask what the hell was that bro. T says with a weak voice, I have no idea other than what you know I do aka drug dealing. We take a deep breath, we hit the bottle some more. The next 20 minutes we sat in silence and came to grips with almost being involved in a sting operation, robbed by rivals or even worse. Once our heart rates dropped under 250 beats per minute, we finally headed out to meet the women. T and I never spoke of that moment ever again, and to this day the thought of that night still chills me to the core. Scary men in the white van, let's not cross paths ever again. This story takes place when I was 17, in a small border town that I grew up in. I lived in a house on a steep hill and I took the bus every morning and after school to come home. Classes started very early and no other students lived on my small street. It must have been during the winter because it was very cold every morning which isn't a usual thing where I lived. I remember being afraid every morning because it was very dark outside and I only had the light of the moon to guide me and back then cell phones didn't have flashlights that you can use to guide your way in the dark. There were only three other houses on my small street and they were all on a big hill with paved driveways going down and meeting a gravely road. The houses were arranged around a gravel cul-de-sac which many people used to turn around if they went down the wrong road. I live in a desert area so there were leafless mesquite trees and cactus around to where it was very reminiscent of a forest or dense floor area. It was so quiet that all you could hear were the bats fluttering around the one street light that decided to work on the off day, but usually it was just pitch black. 
along with the yapping of coyotes and crickets chirping, other than that all I could hear was the crunching of the gravel beneath my feet. The first time I saw the man in a van I wasn't that surprised, a lot of the time we would get these white vans passing through because they delivered the papers to the surrounding houses. I then started to realize that this van would stop right next to me when I was standing alone waiting for the bus to arrive. There was a stop sign there, but there was no reason for the person in the van to be stopped there for 10 minutes until the bus picked me up. He must have started to get brave after that because he would roll his window down and ask me if I was cold. I'd say yes and ignore his presence and pretend like nothing happened. I just figured he was trying to be nice to me. He was an older Hispanic man, in his 70s. Again, the next day he pulls up even closer to me. Are you cold? You look beautiful today. But you look so cold. This time I just ignored him and waited for the bus to pull up and I got in. I would watch his van pull away after my bus left. He kept doing this for two weeks until one day he looked at me through his window and said, I could use a pretty girl like you. It's cold outside. You must be so cold. Come inside my van and I'll keep you warm until your bus gets here. I looked at him in horror and luckily the bus pulled up a few seconds later and I decided I needed to tell someone about him. My dad is in law enforcement and I told my dad what had been happening. He asked me what he looked like and when the van would pull up. He said I should have told him sooner, but he's glad I told him when I did. He called the police and I told the police what had been happening. They said they had similar reports in the area and that they would catch him. The next day the police hid behind me, where the cul-de-sac is and I stood in my usual spot where I stood for the bus. I remember that day the street light was finally working and I could see the man's face in the van. He didn't realize the officer was there until he made a full turn around the cul-de-sac and started towards me. The police turned their lights on and pulled him over. I could hear him yelling as the bus pulled in and I left for school. I could see the police lights glaring on the bus windows. The next day my dad sat me down and told me he had to talk to me. Apparently the man had many suspicious things in the van. He had duct tape, plastic bags, zip ties, condoms, lube, black trash bags, a machete and some other strange things. He claimed to be a newspaper man and he would distribute the newspapers to my neighbors, yet the police never found one newspaper in his van when they had searched it. My dad ran a background check on him and he had a CD passed. I'm not sure whatever happened to the man legally but he never showed his face on the street again. But whenever I stood there at the end of the street all I could think about was if he had gotten the courage to step out of his van that I would have had no way to defend myself and no one would have heard from me again. To the man in the white van, I hope no pretty, cold teenage girl ever meets you again. In 2002, my husband was deployed out of the country for 15 straight months, and I kept our housing unit occupied, on a military post in the eastern time zone, halfway between Canada and Mexico, with our two children, two cats, and my 90-pound bulldog slash mastiff mix. I worked at a large, privately owned, wildlife rehab a day or two a week. This charity participated in a bingo charity nearby to raise funds and it competed with another charity run by two people who claimed to be in witness protection for witnessing a murder up north. They were sketchy people to say the least, I met two people who were terrified after dealing with them, and they claimed ignorance as to why large dogs and cats disappeared in their care. During the 15-month separation, I decided that our oldest was ready to assume the responsibility of caring for the housing unit, with the help of a neighbor, while I left for short periods of time. He learned how to answer the phone, to lock the doors, how to call our bulldog to the main doors should anyone cause any problems, and how to call our neighbor if anything seemed amiss or if anyone got hurt, so too did our youngest. This being so, I asked our neighbor to be on call one night as I drove to a super Walmart to get groceries. She agreed, and I left in our two-door tracker soft top. The Walmart I went to was 15 miles away in a slightly larger city than the one nearest post. Its main parking lot was very long, as the sides had no spots. To its left was a Lowe's. I parked about 15 spaces away from the store's fronts, so I was much closer to the side road leading to Lowe's than to the store itself. When I parked, there were a few cars by mine, and it was dusk. When I came out, about 25 minutes later, it was fully dark, around 9.15 p.m., and my car was one of the only cars at the end of the parking lot. There was one car by mine, though. A van. It was one of those windowless utility vans like from the 70s, or at least the design has never been updated. It was a dull white. The weird thing about the van was that it was parked ahead of my car. 
lest I would have never seen my car at all. See, two-door trackers are short. Even in a regularly parked manner, they are not visible from the bottom of a parking aisle, as most other cars are longer than it. The van was the only car parked by mine at all, and it was parked almost in between the space next to mine and the space in front of itself. As I approached the back of my tracker, I was going to put the groceries in the back, I saw that the van was parked in such a way that its sliding side door on the right side was adjacent to my driver's side door. It was also parked rather closely, so that if I opened my driver's side door, and someone slid open the van's side door, I could not run forward in between the two. This crap gave me the willies. I remember very well putting plastic bags of Walmart crap in the back of the car and wondering just why someone would park like that. Why? Here's the thing about stuff like this, too. When a female slash young woman slash chica slash girl slash however you categorize us sees something this freaky in real life, she might not get it. Unless she grew up in Detroit or the west side of Cleveland, danger signs blink a little slower. And worse, we're told by our family that we are imagining things when we report that we were scared about something. I had given birth to a child in a foreign country, ran cross country in a place where boar dogs roamed, and taken care of many situations with crazy neighbors without a man before hence the big dog, but I still stood there at the back of the tracker, trying to figure out why I was unsettled. It happens. I think we don't think that the worst can happen, which is why when slash if it does, we might freeze. It never occurred to us that we might really be in trouble. All this being so, I decided to listen to the idiot voice in my head, and I closed the back of the tracker, and I walked over to the passenger side of the car. I unlocked it, tossed my purse in the back, and crawled over the stick shift as fast as I could, closing the door quickly behind me and hitting the lock. I then shoved the key into the ignition while slamming down the emergency brake, put the car into first, and gave gas. I pulled away from the van, turned right, and sped away to the lowest portion of the parking lot, all without putting on my seat belt or turning on the lights. By the time I pulled another right around to face the same direction, the van was still there. I put on my seat belt, and as I began to adjust myself, the van left. I drove home carefully. When I got home, the kids were fine, and our dog was happy, and the neighbors said nothing amiss happened. This might be the end of the story, but it isn't. A few weeks later, I had to go to Walmart again, and the neighbor said she also needed a thing or two, so I told her we could barter. I bought her two things, and she kept an eye on my children. Again, I parked near the end of the parking lot. This time, however, I took our other car, a four-door, hardtop, five-speed tracker, we liked the cars, sue me. I shopped quickly. Upon leaving the store and walking toward our car with the cart, I stopped dead in my tracks about ten parking spaces out, because a windowless, white utility van was parked near our car, but parked slightly forward. Again, I must have stood there for twenty seconds, trying to gather what was happening. I take this time to redress the concept of reality, was this crap really happening? I can only remember certain things about that moment. I know I turned my cart around. I know I felt numb. I know I felt like I was floating, not walking, and that I was floating too slowly to get back to the store for my liking. I remember that my teeth thudded in my head with every footstep, even though I was floating. When I did get to the building, I walked up to the tallest person in a blue vest and cheerfully asked if he could walk me out to my car. I did not say, someone is trying to abduct me. I seemed to remember thinking that would discredit me. It all happened very quickly, so instead I asked nicely if I could have an escort to my car. He nudged his chin up in another person's direction and walked with me toward the doors. When we got outside, though, the white van was gone. I figured it might be, but that made me wonder if I imagined it. I wish I could explain that. Anyway, I told him I would really just appreciate it if he watched me load my groceries and drive away. He was very nice. He did just that. As I drove home, I watched for trailing cars. None. I hope so. Anyway, by then, 911 had occurred, sadly, and it was hard to get on post without an ID. I called the police that night and told them about both incidents. I did not file a report, but I left my phone number and said I would come in if anyone else experienced a white van issue. As I thought, I was not taken seriously. I take responsibility for not calling the police the first time. I stopped working for the charity a while later. Later that year, decomposed animal bodies, like Roddy's, were dug up by people who lived near the property of the witness protection charity owners. Nothing was done about the skeletons. 
Roddy Killers slash White Van Owners slash Walmart Parking Lot Creepers, let's not meet. Ever.